Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles uh, this morning, let me encourage you to open them to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis 45. <clears throat> and while you're doing that, let me just welcome you. Uh, as Pastor Josh said, I am not Pastor Chad. So if this is your first time here, you'll have to come back and uh, to hear Pastor Chad. But he's out at Reach Church this morning. And so uh, we've got our Reach Church uh, part of our worship team out here this morning. They did a great job, didn't they? Would you show them your appreciation? <clears throat> It's an amazing thing that God is doing um, out in DeSoto, and I just want to thank you uh, for your prayers for us and for your investment uh, in our church as a whole. Uh, it's an amazing to see how God is growing us through this season, uh, how he's just, he's at work in all of our services and all of our campuses, and really it's a testimony to your faithfulness, uh, to your vision, and to your prayer, so thank you so much. Really, the the, the lives that have been changed, the souls that have been saved and baptized and discipled, uh, those can be attributed to your account. And uh, we thank you for your partnership at Reach Church. If you have not had an opportunity to come out and, and worship with us, I want to invite you to do that. We also worship at 9, 30, and 11. So um, you can worship here one of those services and then hop in your car and make the drive out there. Uh, it's 45 mile an hour on 83rd Street. I know that. Okay. So uh, try to keep it below 80, all right? And you can make it out there. And, uh, or you can just get on K10 and go 100. That's what people do now. So uh, you do you. But we really would encourage you to come out and just worship with us and see uh, what God is doing, the spirit he's fostering there, and uh, how the church is growing. One church, uh, multiple locations, and boy, God is good. It's an honor for us to be here today. Um, really, several years ago, my wife Kim and I, and, our, and at that time our two girls, we, we found ourselves at a Lenexa Baptist Church service. And um, we, when we left that day, we were sitting over here, so over here, you know, the power of God's going to be on this over here. When we left that day, uh, we just spoke to each other on the way home, and we just knew that our lives were never going to be the same, and they haven't been. And I just want to encourage you, if God is, you know, give God the blueprints of your life, and just let him do what he can do. Because our, you know, the Bible says in Isaiah, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, they're so much better and God's plans for your life, and what he could do with you if you just be willing to, and obedient, it's unbelievable how God could use you. And there's a real need for you to be involved and active in the ministry uh, of the church today. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of our folks who are joining us online. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Kansas City, so I hope wherever you are that um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful day there as well. And also want to uh, welcome our venue service. I hear there's a couple of baptisms this morning, so Praise God for uh, folks following the Lord in believer's baptism, and I'm sure it's going to be a tremendous day. Well, here in Genesis 45, I got pretty lucky. I get to preach to you the, uh, the grand finale of the Joseph account. Uh, this is really where we start to see all of the pieces come together. And for a while, uh, we were a little bit worried, weren't we? When Joseph has is, is had these dreams, the next thing you know, he's down in the bottom of a pit, and then next thing you know, he's in a dungeon, and uh, boy, how is God going to work this out? You ever been there? God, how, how are you going to work this mess out? Um, it reminds me of that one time that uh, Kimberly and I decided to do a home, home improvement project, right? Any of you guys been there? You say, oh, I, you know, I've, I've watched a few YouTube tutorials. Okay, I've watched a little Chip and Joanna. I can dive into that. So you head on down to the hardware store, and uh, next thing you know, you're tearing up something. And, and there's always kind of a, a period for us where about halfway through it, we're like, oh, no. You know, what, what have we done? This is, this is a mass chaos. Uh, or uh, Ikea, all right? We love to go to Ikea. Our girls love to go to Ikea and, and uh, just walk, touch everything. You know how they are. Um, but, you know, you buy something from Ikea. It's got about a trillion pieces to it. It's got a, a, a manual, 100 pages thick with no words. And there's always kind of a, a point in there when you're like, I should have hired a professional, right? And you're like, but, you know, if you just keep at it, eventually you start to see it take form, and uh, even if it was supposed to be a bookcase and it turns into a bed, that's okay. You know, eventually it, it, it takes form, and you start seeing all these pieces come together. And this is where we're at here in, Ge in Genesis 45. Um, last week, we saw Judah's dynamic speech to Joseph, and now Joseph is convinced that not only Judah has been changed, but his brothers have been changed. They are not the same as they were 
some 20 years ago. And Joseph's response to that is going to be just an outpouring, uh, a flood of love. And so as we dive into this, we're going to read the, the first 15 verses here initially, and then um, we'll, we'll, we will reference some verses uh, later on in the chapter as we get into the message. But join with me in reading here Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. The Bible says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph uh, made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will neither be plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his household and the ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me a Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You, your children, your children's children, and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, and for there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you, you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of your brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all the splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck, and he wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we enter into this time, really, it's a sacred time, where, Father, we ask you to make the, the pages of the Bible and the words of the Bible come to life. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive exactly what you'd have for us as individuals, as families, and as, as a church. God, I pray you'd speak through me exactly what you would want to say. And God, we thank you for uh, what you'll do. Help us, Lord, to not leave here the same, but to leave here challenged and encouraged and changed. We ask this in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, the first thing we see here in verse number three is the proclamation. The proclamation. Joseph reveals to his brothers that uh, he says, I am Joseph. And if you're like me, I like to imagine this as it would have played out, right? Um, Joseph, he's, he's obviously coming uh, apart at the seams emotionally, the Bible says that he could no longer control himself and that he was weeping so loud that uh, those outside of that palace chamber could hear. And then the brothers, thoroughly confused as to what, as to what is going on, the, the, they're watching this, this, this prince in front of him come unraveled, and they're probably moving in close to one another, scooting backwards, thinking, what is going on? And they could hardly guess the next words that would come out of Joseph's mouth. One commentator asked this question. He says, has the highest dramatic genius ever winged an arrow which goes more surely to the heart than these three words, I am Joseph. It's an amazing thought. And in this, we, we, we see some, some truths about Joseph. We, it, the Bible reveals to us his humanity Right? Don't you love that the Bible does this? Like the accounts and the characters, will, were, they were real men and women just like you and me. And, and they had real lives and real hearts and real emotions. And these, and these emotions that are, we're reading on the pages of Scripture, they come to life to us as we relate to the character. And, and his humanity comes to life. The, these emotions would have been mo emotions of, uh, of just 
uh, joy and relief, uh, joy of reconciliation uh, now and reunion, now that he really believes that his brothers are not the same. This is what he's been hoping for. All this back and forth of chapters 42, 43, and 44 have been to prove them and to test them to see if they had been changed. And he's so relieved and it overcomes him with emotion that they are not the same. And then just, just of joy, of that reunion that would come. We also see in this his love for his father. Right after he reveals himself, he asks that question, is my father still alive? And we've seen this before in the previous chapters. He's always been concerned about the welfare of his father. Yet he sacrificed. What he, he could have went to his father at any time. Yet he chose to delay that to let God's perfect work be done in the lives of his brothers. And so we find that he, 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 his humanity is revealed to us in his love for his father. Even though he's second in command, he's still simply his father's son. And he still would have been grieved at the sudden separation that had taken place some 20 years earlier. Well, we don't only see uh, Joseph's humanity, but we see the brother's humiliation, don't we? And we can understand why. They had already come to regret all that they had done to Joseph. We find uh, in chapter 42 and verse 21 that they said to one another, truly, we are guilty concerning our brother. Because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us Yet we would not listen. For this reason, this distress has happened to us. And so you have this scene, right? Joseph standing here, coming undone. The brothers huddled up, moving backwards, retreating, stunned, terrified, open mouth, yet unable to speak. And boy, this teaches us some things, doesn't it? It shows us just the, the profitlessness of sin. The profitlessness of sin. Ultimately, we will reap what we sow. We will find that what we are running from will come back around to haunt us. Ultimately in sin, there is no profit. And so I don't know if there's something in your life that, that you are trying to circumvent the truth of God's word to achieve. Let me just ask you, don't, don't do that. We cannot go past, we cannot usurp the, the authority and the truth of God to find short-term success. There is ultimately no profit in sin. Have you ever been here? I, I'll just say, as a preacher, I've been here. Struck face to face with the reality that the sin you've been running from has come back around and it's staring at you eyeball to eyeball. And so they're terrified. They think, we are done. This is the end for us. And this is what we all wonder. God, is this sin, is it the end of me? There's no way out of my situation. I am guilty. There's no help coming. But listen, church, it's here when we are most deserving of condemnation that we are in a perfect position to see the compassion of the Lord. He brings us to the precipice to show us the state of our own sinful heart and then he brings us back in. And so as we move forward from the proclamation, we see the pardon of Joseph. The pardon from Joseph. Look with me in verse 4. Joseph calls to his brothers and he says, please come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Notice with me quickly, church, just the personal nature of of Joseph's forgiveness. Again, he says, come closer. To this retreating group of guilty sinners, he says, no, 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 come closer to me. In the very moment that they could have been expelled out and sentenced to death or to prison, he invites them in to receive reconciliation. Isn't this what Christ does to us? I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, where the Bible says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Just like Joseph calls those brothers in, the Lord has an undeniable uh, invitation to himself. He says, come, come who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's the invitation today. Now, don't retreat from the Lord. We're all guilty. But in Christ's presence, we find forgiveness. 
Notice, not only does he say, come closer, but he says, I am your brother. He doesn't say, I am your ruler, I am your king, I am your judge, which he could have said. He says, no, I am your brother. And in this, he, he is showing them uh, this familial love. He's identifying as one of them. Boy, this would have been so powerful in that room as, as he relates to one of them and as the brothers find their aching hearts soothed by, by what the words that Joseph is saying. You know, this is how God relates to us. God relates to us as a father. And boy, we, we all can understand what that means. Just the relationship of, of father and children. Jesus relates to us as brother and as friend. And aren't you glad that he does? Jesus is with us as a brother, according to Hebrews, and as a friend, according to John chapter 15, 15. So not only does he pull them in close, not only does he relate to them as brother, but he allows them to release their guilty hearts, their guilty consciences. He says, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves. He says, there is a reason that I am here. And so we see the providence of God come to the front of the stage in verse number four, we saw that Joseph said, you might have sold me into Egypt, but in verse five, the Bible says, God sent me before you. In verse seven, it says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth. And then in verse eight, it says, God has made me. The providence of God is all over the life of Joseph. And it's really all over the life of the brothers as well. God is doing a work in their lives as well. He's in the middle of this story. And when we look at the providence of God, we need to recognize some things about how he chooses to work in us and among us and through us. First of all, we must recognize that God chooses to work even through human failings. Recognize that God is at work through human failings. And I, and I praise God that he does because Hey, listen, if we had to be perfect to be usable, none of us would be usable. We all have sinned. We all have come short of the glory of God. Yet God chooses to use even uh, lost causes in our own minds. He chooses to use them for his glory. Remember, the Bible says, you sold me, but actually it was God who sent me. Man's plans and actions cannot and will never be able to stop the plans of God. It's been over 20 years now. Joseph's dreams have come true, and all the wickedness of the brothers has not turned the stream of the divine purpose any more than a child's little mud dam could divert the mighty Mississippi. You just aren't going to be able to stop the plans of God. So recognize he's at work through human failings. Secondly, recognize that God's providence and sovereignty help us in our ability to forgive one another. So how could Joseph forgive all the, the terrible wrongs that were done to him? How can you and I today forgive those who have wronged us? There's probably someone in each and every one of our lives that we're holding uh, a little bit of a grudge against. How is it that we're able to forgive even in the midst of extremely painful, con well, it's because we can recognize, just like Joseph did, that God is at work. So he, Joseph looks past all the human envy and all the hate and all the evil, and he can see, even in the midst of that, the divine purpose that is at work. Reminds me of Psalm chapter 44, verse 3, which teaches us that even though the sword might be theirs, the hand that wields the sword is thine. And so it's an important understanding for us to grasp that Joseph is able to forgive. He's able to look above their, their hatred and their malice because he sees God at work. And this didn't happen overnight for him, understand. This is a, something that God does in our, in our lives over years. Joseph was able to eventually recognize the divine shaping that was taking place in his life. He's able to look down at his conscious stricken brothers and he's able to forgive them because of the reality of God's presence in his life. When, when in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when Stephen is in front of the council giving his defense for 
the, the ministry he is leading, and eventually this would lead to his execution, he's giving a defense of why he believes uh, that, the, that the truth that he is preaching is from God. And he brings up Joseph. And something, he says one specific thing about Joseph. He says, even though his fathers and his brothers sold him into slavery, it has a comma, and then it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. And that was the defining factor in his life. And that will be the, the overriding factor in each and every one of our lives, in our families, in our churches. If God is with us, there is nothing that can stand against us. Yet sometimes we allow fear and, and, just, and, and we hold on to, to wrongs done us. Listen, we're going to get to it in a minute, but our enemy is Satan. Our enemy is the devil. That's who we need to war against. We need to forgive those around us and allow that, that, that forgiving love to not only set them free, but to set us free as well. The providence of God is all over this story. Recognize he's at work through human failings. Recognize that God's providence and sovereignty help us in our ability to forgive. And then finally, recognize that God's purposes are often beyond our immediate understanding. Now, we don't like this, right? We, we, we want to know uh, the, the clear road ahead before we get onto it, right? We, we want to know how it's all going to work out. But unfortunately, in the Christian life, it's often a step-by-step -step type of scenario. And so when we recognize that the providence of God is often beyond our immediate understanding, it teaches us some things. So here in verse 11, Joseph thinks that he's a part of the five-year plan. Look with me in verse 11. The Bible says there, I'll also provide for you, and there are still five years of famine to come. So Joseph thinks, yeah, God brought me all here to get you through these last five years. But in all reality, Joseph is a part of the 400-year plan, right? This is part of God's overarching work to move Israel to a place where they can thrive and multiply and ultimately this move is so that they can see the mighty hand of God through the deliverance from Egyptian bondage. So this is an amazing thing. God plays the long game, right? He plays the long game, not only for our immediate deliverance, but God is working out our ultimate deliverance. So just because we can't see how all the little pieces are fitting together yet, we must trust that God is at work and that he is working about our salvation. He is working about our ultimate deliverance. And the more that we seek to find out what God is doing today by placing us where we are in this season, the better we can be at peace. And the better we can trust God for the ultimate purposes that he is working out. Live out the life that God intends for you today. And whether he puts you in a dungeon or in a palace, it makes no difference. You can do God's will. You can do God's will. Please don't lose sight of God in the dungeon seasons of your life or you'll never have the clarity that you need when he brings you into the palace. And so we move on from the providence of God and we see the provision of God. In verse 10, the Bible says, you shall live in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And then verse 11, it says, I will provide for you. Look in verse 17 through 20. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are ordered, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. And notice verse 20. Don't concern yourself with your goods, for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. Church, isn't this just like God to provide for his children in such a sovereign and a grand fashion? But we can't move past the progression that led to the provision. First, he deals with the brothers' hearts. He deals with their sin. He confronts the sin, and then they repent and then they're reconciled, and then they're in a position to receive forgiveness and blessing. We can't move past what God is pointing out in our own hearts if we want to receive blessing from him. 
We think, God, bless me. God, provide for me. I'm in a tight space. Okay, the first thing we need to do is, is, is take a step back and, and, and really connect with God and say, God, is there something in my own heart that you're trying to deal with here? Is this season I'm going through, is it something that you're trying to teach me or you're trying to purge me or you're trying to refine me? Notice when he pulls him in, he doesn't right off the bat say, hey, go hitch up, hitch up the wagons. He's saying, hey, we got to confront this issue in your heart. And so he confronts sin. They repent. He brings reconciliation and forgiveness, and then they're in a position to receive blessing. Notice the source of the provision. And, and this one it was hard for me to work past. Who, who would it be that God would use to, to bless Jacob and Israel and his family? It was Egypt. All, all throughout the, the Bible, Egypt is just a picture of, uh, of the enemy of God and, and of the world and of sin. Yet isn't it amazing how everything is usable in the hands of the Father? Listen, everything is just a pawn in his hand. And he's so loving. And he's so sovereign and he's so wise. He, he has the ability to take even the worst of situations and the worst of, of just things and turn them around into a blessing for his children. And then notice the magnitude of the provision. The Bible says that the best of the land was waiting for them. The best of the land. Do we realize this today as a church? That the best is waiting for us as well? The best is yet to come. Let us not set our eyes or our hearts so deeply or so intently on this old world, but let us look ahead to a blessed land where Christ has gone to prepare a place for us. This is where the rubber meets the road for a Christian. Will we be the Colossians type of Christians that God is calling us to be, to, to look ahead, to set our affections on, on, in heavenly places? Or we, we, we continue to allow ourselves to, to, to drive deep stakes in this old world? At any given time, would you have the ability and the capacity to pivot and follow God's leading if he called you to uproot and follow him? It's a, it's a question we all should be asking ourselves. Where is the affections of our hearts? Are we looking towards that heavenly land, that ultimate blessedness, or are our eyes and our hearts so strictly uh, focused on this old world? And then notice the precaution in verse 24. Notice Joseph's precaution. He says there in verse 24, so he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the journey. Do not quarrel on the journey. Before Joseph sends his brothers back to Canaan, he restores them to fellowship with himself and with one another. And in verse 15, we read that Joseph kissed all his brothers and he hugged them and they spoke openly with each other. Really, think with me, for the very first time. This is the first time they, they'd all been together in a room sharing openly with no hatred and envy and strife and plotting to kill one another. They're talking openly. Forgiveness has restored life to this family. But Joseph knew his brothers. And, and if we're honest, we know ourselves, right? We are just prone to get a few steps away from that reconciliation or that forgiveness or that harmony and we find ourselves slipping back down into discord. We find ourselves slipping down into strife and accusation and division. And again, just let me say, your enemy is not in this room. Your enemy is the devil. And so we need to do whatever it takes to stay in harmony with one another. The church is a beautiful thing. How can you take people of all ages from all different backgrounds, from different races and creeds, and how can you see them united only through the common love of a Savior? And this is what unites us. And so Joseph's saying to his brothers, listen, when you get out on that road to Canaan, when you get out on that road that, that we've provided for you and a, and a, a pathway to come back to us and to receive blessedness, don't you be fighting with one another again. It's in the past. Put it in the past. Let us all take the admonition from Paul to the Philippians when he said, 
forget what lies behind, but reach forward to what is ahead. Paul says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so there are two sides to this church. There's this one side where sometimes in our own lives, we won't let it go in ourselves. Like we allow, remember Pastor Chad said last week that sometimes there's these trigger words or these trigger situations that when we account, encounter them, we find, ooh, that hurts. We have shame rising up again. We have condemnation that, that hits our hearts. We've got to be disciplined to fight that with truth. Don't live in that. Listen, it's been forgiven. It's in the past. Don't allow yourself to constantly be, be handcuffed by past failures that you've been forgiven of. And then the other side of this is when we sometimes, as, as believers, we, we sometimes won't let it go in the lives of other people. You know, they've been forgiven. They've been reconciled. They've moved on. Shame on us if we're the ones that are bringing it back up in their lives. Let's allow them to move on. And let's move on ourselves. The brothers have been changed. Forgiveness has opened their lips and their hearts. Fellowship has been restored. And so should it be with every believer in this room today. If you've tasted of the sweetness of Christ's forgiving love, let us continue on in fellowship and we must avoid the temptation of quarreling on the journey in which we find ourselves today. So no quarreling on the way out of here, all right? You exit in an orderly fashion. And then finally, we see the persuasion. The persuasion of Jacob. Look in verse 25 through 28. Uh, they went up from Egypt and they came to the land of Canaan to their father and they told him saying, Joseph is still alive. And indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned for he did not believe them. When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, it is enough or I am convinced that my, soul, my son Joseph is still alive, I will go and see him before I die. Have you ever heard news that was just too good to be true? You ever heard something just too good to be true? This is Jacob's response, right? In his heart, there's some disconnect between what is being spoken to him, the truth that's being spoken to him, and the believability of the faith in his heart. The, the circuit is broken. And he needs help getting that flip switch, switch flipped. And don't we all sometimes? We hear something in the truth of God's word and we find that our faith to receive it and put it into action is a little bit lacking. Maybe this was you when you first heard the gospel. Maybe the, the, the good news that Jesus loves you even despite your sin and that he would go so far as to be beaten for you and to die for you, maybe that's just too good a news for you to accept knowing who you are. But let me just say to you today, find the faith to believe it. Jesus will meet you where you are, and he will, listen, once you accept that message, transformation happens in your heart. And for some, you know, it, it, it's, you guys remember when Christ was risen from the dead? There was old Thomas. Who just, you know, he, Thomas wasn't there when Christ appeared to the disciples. And so the disciples, his buddies, go and say, Christ has risen from the dead. And Thomas was like, no, he ain't. Uh, I didn't see him. Unless I see him for myself, I'm not going to believe. And there's a little bit of a doubting Thomas in all of us. This is the definition of Proverbs 25, 25, which says, uh, let me read it here for you. Like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. And for Jacob, this isn't just good news. This is the best news because it wipes out some 20 years of sorrow thinking that his son is died. Psalm 43, 5 says, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. How is your hope doing this morning? Is God speaking something into your life that you're having a hard time believing? Is your hope waning as you look at your situations or as, at the reality of the last 20 years of your life? 
God gives us some things to help us be able to say, I will praise him yet again. And we see it in verse 27. What was it that helped Jacob be persuaded? What was it that when Jacob heard and saw these things, he said, my soul is revived? Well, look with me. It says, when Jacob heard the words of Joseph and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent. And the Lord spoke to me in a a real, just intimate way when I was reading this. And he said, Ryan, I've sent you some words to help you in your journey, to help you in your hope. I've given you some words in the Bible. Aren't you glad that God has given us words that help connect the dots between our faith and our current situation? Aren't you glad that when you go to the Bible day by day, you find that once again it is alive and it is a balm for your soul? Sometimes the words come through devotions. Sometimes the word comes through a preacher or or, or a song. Aren't you thankful for the ministry of worship and how sometimes the right song at the right time can change a situation or your perspective for you? God didn't only give him words, though. He gave him these wagons. The Bible says that Joseph sent wagons to carry Jacob home. Really, these wagons are evidences that the source of the word is true. And what evidences have you seen in your life that God is at work? What evidences are all over your life that God has carried you when you needed it and that God is working through you and that God is with you? These evidences, these wagons have been many things in my life. Sometimes they have been people, the right person at the right time with the right word. Sometimes it's been the church. When there was uh, parts of my spiritual journey where I could not take a step by myself, God sent the church to hitch on to me and to pull me along when I needed it. That's why we can't be disconnected from one another. You never know whom it is that we need to say on any given Sunday, hey, I'm praying for you. And hey, let me help you on this this next week. Maybe your wagon has been just a divine blessing. God has the ability to send us exactly what we need right when we need it. And it's in those times that we can just drop and hit our knees and say, thank you, God, for showing me once again that you are real and that you evidence yourself in this blessing. Sometimes it's a divine interruption. God stops you right where you are and he says, You're not moving any further unless you recognize it's me who's at work. God sends us these words and these wagons and we thank him for it. Are you persuaded today that God is good? Are you persuaded that he's still in control? For I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him against that day. And then to button this whole thing up, we cannot close the page on this chapter without talking about the parallels. The parallels between Christ and Joseph are undeniable. Christ, he has been proclaimed to us, and we stand before him guilty. Christ suffered unjustly at the hand of sinners, but it was all according to God's plan so that we might have a way to be forgiven. When Paul was preaching in Acts 17 to Thessalonica, He he was preaching and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and that he had to rise again from the dead. And he was saying to that group, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you, he is the Christ. And in this Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. And these sins that he's forgiven us, he's cast them as far as the east is from the west. Christ, too, was envied and he was sold out by his brothers. His sufferings were meant to preserve life for you and for me. Our sin was against him, but he now pleads with us and seeks with us to draw us nearer to himself. He has provided for us a dwelling place with an abundance of good things. Jesus manifests himself to us as a brother and as a friend, even though we were once his despisers and his enemies. He assures us of the love of his riches and the riches of his grace. He commands us to lay aside evil, anger, malice, and strife and to pursue peace with one another. He teaches us to give up the world for him and for his fullness. 
He supplies all that we need to bring him home to himself, that where he is, we may be also. And when he at last sends for his people, even though we may for a time feel doubts and we feel fears, just the the thought of seeing him and his glory and to be with him enables his church to say, I am convinced it is enough. I am willing even to die knowing that I will go to see and to be with the beloved of my soul. This is the unbelievable message of Genesis 45. And this is the God whom we serve and the Savior who loves us. He's proclaimed himself to us. He's pardoned us. Boy, he gives us so much uh, provision. He provides for us and he's at work in our lives and in the church. God's hand is all over this place and he's all over your life if you just look for it. And if you trust him, even when you can't trace his hand, are you persuaded today that he is good and that with him we will never, never, never encounter anything that can overcome us? I don't know about you today. Maybe some of you are hearing this message for the very first time. And if that's you, let me encourage you to take that step towards Christ. If he's drawing you in, take that next step to Christ. We can meet you down here. We can pray with you and help you through that spiritual decision. I can't imagine living a a life today without Christ, without the comfort, without the confidence. And maybe he's revealing some area of your life that he wants you to change. Maybe it's a shift. Maybe it's a move Maybe it's a step out into the unknown. God will meet you there. I just want to encourage you to pray with me. Pastor Josh will come to the stage and we will have a song of invitation. And this will be your time just to step out and trust Christ. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your word. And God, I'm humbled by just the opportunity that we have to open it. God, after this last year, we will never take it for granted. God, thank you for meeting with us once again. God, thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered, there are you in the midst. So Father, I pray that you would help us now to have the faith and confidence to step out for you. God, I pray that you would help us to follow you. God, if we're in the dungeon season of our life, help us to see you. God, if we're in the palace today, help us to look out for those around us that we can pull in. And God, I just want to thank you for saving our souls, even when we were unworthy. And God, you are still in the saving business today, so I pray that you would, Lord, speak to hearts. God, open up, uh, Lord, our confidence just to be able to trust you. Jesus, thank you for the work that you're doing amongst our different campuses and in our services. Lord, it's undeniable that you are on the move. Help us to be with you. Help us to follow you. And it's in your name we pray.